and, and welcome to class again. Uh, week, what is this, 14, I guess, 13, 14, whatever, it doesn't matter because future generations will see this and it won't be the same for them anyway. Speaking to the future. Um, last week we pretty much finished dealing with um, African American soldiers in Vietnam. Talked a little bit about uh, uh, the difficulties uh, faced by black soldiers in Vietnam and how they mirrored a lot of developments that were going on in white society. And the last thing I mentioned uh, was, was the idea of the way blacks responded to that. And you see a great deal of similarity between uh, black responses in Vietnam and black responses at home. African American soldiers uh, could see the inconsistency, contradiction, hypocrisy, whichever word you want to use of fighting this war for freedom and democracy or whatever the rhetoric was in Vietnam while having to fight a civil rights movement and then after that um, in being involved in the black power movement. Uh, so um, you clearly have this contradiction then between the issue of democracy at home and what's happening um, on the battlefield of Vietnam and African American leaders clearly see that the most notable of course was uh, Martin Luther King who in his very powerful speech which is in the reader really pointed out the inconsistencies of asking uh, black and white young men to kill and die in the same platoon, in the same unit in Vietnam, where they would never be given the opportunity to go to the same school or live in the same neighborhood in, in most cities in the United States, northern and southern. Um, dorm rooms uh, throughout the, the country, especially among African American students, have uh, posters of Stokely Carmichael, uh, with the, the words above it, uh, hell no, we won't go, encouraging draft resistance, especially among uh, young black men. Um, so Glee Carmichael explained further, from Mississippi to Harlem to Vietnam, a powerful few have been maintained and enriched at the expense of the poor and voiceless colored masses. Uh, within the U.S., Stokely Carmichael says, uh, the biggest problem blacks had was a federal government that cares far more about winning the war on the Vietnamese than the war on poverty, which is unwilling to curb the misuse of white power, but quick to condemn black power. And these kinds of words were not lost on soldiers in Vietnam. And so you quite often see uh, uh, the type of things we talked about last week, the cultural adaptations, things like dapping, wearing a, a, you know, an afro, um, general uh, attitudes uh, that uh, they had to stick together. Black soldiers would stick together in cultural identification. Now this doesn't happen in all cases. These are just general trends. Um, in the end, the Army did respond for the most part and enacted reforms. And so you have this uh, something of an irony, I guess, where even though the military had uh, a lot of the same racial problems, identical racial problems that you would have in society at large, it also becomes a way for a lot of uh, not just African American but other minority groups to actually get ahead, uh, to, to, to get a decent income, to get the possibility of education and so forth. Um, you know, uh, I've talked to recruiters before and heard recruiters speak and they'll go into inner city high schools to recruit for the armed forces and they're the only people there. Uh, corporations won't be there, other types of, you know, career uh, counseling and whatnot won't be there. So generally the military does offer an opportunity. So that's the kind of uh, irony you have and you had it in the Vietnam era as well. Remember, most African Americans are, are enlist enlistees. They're not, they're not draftees. Um, yeah. yeah. I'd like to mention, uh, speaking of ironies uh, in, in this era, one that I think you touched on in the last meeting was that uh, uh, black soldiers were re-enlisting at a rate of about twice as much mm -hmm. as, as white mm -hmm. soldiers. At three times actually, 49 percent to 16 percent. Yeah. The result of that was that it, because also there were so many black soldiers in the infantry units that when it came time to train white soldiers for future involvement in Vietnam, the experienced combat veterans were the black soldiers. Mm. So when you got to advanced infantry training and even into some of the officer training, the drill instructors tended to be black. So what you had were white soldiers having to learn the combat survival skills from black soldiers. And very effectively, I would, I would add, because I think most of the black, uh, uh, because of the service that they had provided in Vietnam, they tended to be very good instructors. And mm -hmm. I think, so a lot of white soldiers that survived Vietnam owe a uh, debt of gratitude to the black soldier that taught them how to survive. And that's exact, obviously an exact reversal of World War II in Korea where blacks weren't allowed to have officers positions. So you would have, in many cases, really incompetent whites assigned to black units. It was not a, an assignment a, a white officer wanted to be assigned to train black units. 
Uh, there was a case in Korea, uh, oh, I forget, a, a general, so it was a division commander, who was just really pretty much a blatant racist and, and uh, really incompetent too and, and basically sent a lot of black soldiers to, to their deaths by his incompetence. And so the Vietnam era, it's, it's a total reversal of that where, where you, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a really complex picture, one that I really, you know, can't do justice to in 30 or 45 minutes. Because on one hand, these racial incidents are clearly true. I mean, uh, things like uh, the selective service system and, and the, the level of uh, military uh, justice, military discipline, military punishment, uh, clearly were disproportionately uh, stacked against African Americans. At the same time, this was an avenue for advancement that you wouldn't find in many places outside of the military in the 1960s. And um, many, you know, many African American leaders pointed that out. Why don't you treat us at home? Give us these opportunities there. So, it's a really, a really textured and complicated uh, picture there, right? Um, and there are a zillion more things I could say about this, but I want to talk a little bit more about um, uh, some other aspects of this and actually get on to, to back to Vietnam to, to the war itself. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Chicanos and Native Americans. Not as much, basically, because less has been done and less is known of this. Um, but nonetheless, it's still quite important. Uh, one issue that's always been of great interest to scholars is this, the kind of the social implications of war and of, of, of mobilizing a military. Uh, and you see a lot of studies on World War I and African-American soldiers and World War II and African-American soldiers and Mexican-American soldiers and things like that. And so the Vietnam era is no different. And it's, it's very interesting for the reasons we already pointed out that, you know, we ask people to fight and die together in this common struggle. Uh, yet the situation at home is quite different and, and with African Americans that's by far the biggest minority group in the Vietnam era and their problems are quite pronounced and of course with people like King and Muhammad Ali uh, they become even more you know aware uh, made the public becomes even more aware of them uh, because of the, the notoriety of it and of course it coincides with with the movement um, Chicanos is somewhat similar but but of nowhere near that magnitude for lots of reasons um, the Chicano movement wasn't mobilized and doesn't have the same legacy, obviously the same history as the, the civil rights movement for African Americans, uh, which is not to say one or the other is more important, but their histories are obviously quite different. Uh, whereas Martin Luther King uh, and Malcolm X, who were kind of uh, icons for the civil rights movement, both took fairly forceful stands against this kind of thing. Um, leaders of the Chicano movement, uh, well, you don't have a, a, somebody of the stature of King, although Cesar Chavez certainly is, is well known and, and has the same kind of moral status. He's probably not as well known as King. And even if he is, and, and that's certainly a, an argument worth making or discussing or thinking about, um, Chavez never has the same political attitudes that King does. So he never speaks out against the war. He's basically concerned with issues of labor and wages and farm workers and things like that. Uh, at the same time, the movement for, for, for Chicano rights gets a fairly late start comparatively. Uh, uh, and again, there are all kinds of historic reasons. That's, I don't want to go th into that because you could you know, be here all day talking about that. But with regard to the 1960s, clearly the civil rights movement is there from the beginning, whereas Chavez and Mexican-American workers and farm workers uh, are, are there as well. I mean, they've been doing the same thing. They've been struggling for, for, for decades up to that point, but really become a national movement much later than the civil rights movement does. And so you don't have the same type of uh, discourse with Chicanos that you will with African Americans, uh, but the, their situation is, is quite similar. Um, a few years ago, there was a symposium here on campus about the Korean War, and one of the keynote speakers uh, was a uh, uh, an officer uh, from Washington, D.C. He was uh, actually the commander of the, the entire National Guard. I can't remember his first name. His last name was Baca, General Baca, B-A-C-A. And during his talk, which was about um, Mexican-Americans in, in American wars, uh, he said something which I've never verified and sounds quite incredible to me, but, you know, could very well be, be on target. Uh, but he said about a quarter of the names on the wall were Hispanic uh, to some extent or another. Uh, which is, you know, really a staggering number. Uh, you know, you, that's nearly 15, that's over 14,000 uh, uh, names on the wall have uh, some type of Hispanic heritage. Uh, I've never seen that number before, um, and it's obviously real difficult to get a beat on that. If you've ever filled out census figures, uh, as, well, now I think they're more detailed, but, but up to, what is it, 1980 or 1990, Hispanic was mostly folded into Anglo. So it's real hard to figure that out. But I have seen one study of names on the walls, just the actual most common names. And the most common are you know, Smith and Jones types. But um, names like Martinez and Garcia and Rodriguez are up, are up there, very close to the top. 
you know, far more than one would assume based on population. So it's probably very safe to say, and these are real hard numbers to come by, unlike African American numbers, which are pretty reliable. Uh, uh, Chicano, Hispanic numbers are, are I think, a, a lot harder to come by. There is a, a database, I used the, the figures from that last time, uh, that the Department of Defense put together. And it doesn't have information specifically on Hispanic American or, African, or uh, Chicano or Mexican American casualties. Um, since Hispanics could be of any race and are often folded in under Anglo, it's real hard to get a real sense of that. Uh, in the 1980 census, for instance, um, oh, wait a second. Okay. Uh, 1980 census, uh, uh, based on this information that these people who did this study revealed that 5 to 6 percent of Americans had Hispanic surnames. But one can cl clearly extrapolate that there are far more Hispanics than that, especially in places like Texas, California, Florida, and elsewhere. Um, so the 1970 census, based on these figures, put the Hispanic population at about 4.5 percent. African-American population was about 12.5%. So we're dealing with a little over a third, you know, relatively. But again, the numbers are, are probably much larger. Even if you, you take that 4.5%, it's fairly safe to say that Hispanic Americans were overrepresented among Vietnam casualties. As I said, Puerto Ricans, who uh, uh, made up in, in terms of um, percentages, I think, the largest casualty rate uh, of any state, more than any state. Um, casualties. In this study, it said there was an estimated about 5 to 6 percent of casualties against 4.5 percent of the 1970 population. So that's a uh, one-third, about, uh, about 25 to 33 percent, about a one-fourth, one-third jump over population. The number of casualties is about a fourth to a third higher than they would be if it were proportional to, to population. And again, if one is to, you know, take Bacchus figures, then it's a staggering increase but the 4.5 percent is probably much larger, too. Um, so these are, are real sketchy. I think it's safe to say, though, you know, ignore all the numbers and statistics for a minute because they'll make you crazy, that Hispanic Americans, like African Americans, probably suffer a disproportionate amount of casualties relative to their percentage of the population. And that's obviously not surprising at all when one sees the economic data, which is like in Christian Appy's article, which, which you should be looking, we should have read already. But when you have uh, uh, disproportionately poor people of fighting and dying in Vietnam than minorities who generally make less money and have fewer opportunities than, than Anglos and Caucasians will take a larger share. And as I said before, some of the states with the uh, biggest um, casualty rates from New Mexico and Arizona, which have uh, a fairly significant uh, Mexican-American uh, populations. Um, so, uh, and other folks have, I think, done studies more specific to uh, you know, regions and, and uh, counties and cities and things like that, and they've come up with similar, similar figures. I've seen a, a study on New Mexico which does that. Um, actually, I may have it here. If I don't have it, I, I'll try to remember. But, you know, with, with Alzheimer's creeping in, I'm not sure I'll, I'll get that right. Um, so that's just kind of a general overview in terms of numbers on Chicanos. On, uh, uh, and again, the, the language here is imprecise as well. I, tend to use them interchangeably, which really isn't historically accurate. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll do that for now. Um, Chicanos, like African Americans, often join the military for the same reasons, uh, which are advancement, uh, a sense of uh, duty, uh, and also uh, um, the fact that it's a good job. It's a relatively good job. Um, one soldier said, uh, I think in the Chicano community there's a positive value placed on being a warrior. The, substan the substantive message is this is how men behave, and we got that growing up. We were aware of the racism, but we were told that this is a country that we're a part of, and I think the implicit message is to prove that you are worthy to be a citizen. I've always in my own heart been proud of the warrior aspect, maybe not so proud of Vietnam, but that's, the contra that's one of the contradictions between who I am and what the war was. And this could have been uttered by an African-American soldier just as easily, this idea that uh, we have to prove ourselves, prove our loyalty. Uh, this is a big issue, especially in the Cold War, when people of color were often looked upon as being, you know, possibly uh, soft. You know, maybe they were going to be corrupted by the communists. So after World War II, you see things like the Zoot Suit Riots, which uh, uh, police repression of Mexican Americans in California, which I think you can directly tie to this idea that these people are different and maybe not trustworthy. You know, maybe they're commies. Uh, you see that with re attacks on uh, African American leaders like Paul Robeson and W.E.B. Du Bois, 
So uh, people of color feel that they have to prove their loyalty more than, than Caucasians will. And so things like joining the military service and serving admirably are ways to do that. And you can also come home and say, look at what we did during the war. Uh, and um, you know, groups form after that. You have uh, uh, associations of black veterans, um, the GI Forum, which was formed, I believe, after World War II um, uh, by um, uh, Mexican-American soldiers. Uh, I'm, I'm loath to tell the story because I may get it wrong. I believe that there was a soldier who was denied burial in Arlington. Was that it? The Mexican-American soldier? I could be wrong about that, so I probably shouldn't. <laughs> there, there was some, something like that, though. And uh, uh, Mex so Mexican-American soldiers formed the GI Forum, established the GI Forum as a way to have this kind of collective action. So there's always this sense that we'll fight to, because we're part of this country and this is a way to show people that we are. Uh, and, and we want the same entitlements and the same rights as everybody else, uh, too. Um, so for Chicanos, probably like with any other group, um, being a soldier represents being a sense of the community, uh, being, uh, showing that you're a, a real American, and there's also the sense that it's an opportunity, economic opp opportunity. So there are cultural and economic forces uh, for that. Um, another uh, a Chicano uh, soldier said, I made an extra effort and it seemed to me all the Chicanos who came had this general tendency. There was something that was driving us. We wanted it to be a good thing and even if it wasn't, we were going to try to make it, uh, make it be if we could. And I think we probably tried too hard and too long. It wasn't because we were like John Wayne types. I think we were trying to be something we were supposed to be there, even if it wasn't turning out that way. And again, I think you'd probably see any minority soldier in Vietnam making a could be making a similar statement. This real kind of unease between what the ideal is being part of this community and also the reality of the war, which is quite unpopular among many soldiers. Uh, so um, this is, a, you know, kind of a, a difficulty for anybody. I know a lot of, you know, from the accounts we've read, many soldiers in Vietnam are part of the, the anti-war movement and they're in VVAW and, and groups like that. And others have racial and cultural aspects of it too. Um, so this, this again adds, makes, makes it even more complicated, which is not easy when you're studying it. Um, like black soldiers, uh, Latin, Latino soldiers often banded together. So you see kind of uh, similar uh, cultures. And again, I mean, this is no different than, than uh, people do in the United States at home. You have people in, in uh, neighborhoods and people uh, who share common cultures and uh, go out to the same places and so forth. Uh, and you see the same thing in Vietnam. One Chicano, uh, Miguel Lemus, said uh, of his platoon, he was in there f in Vietnam from 1967-68, uh, March 67 to March 68. Uh, he said most of the platoon uh, was from Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and California. I met a lot of La, La Raza, La Raza, the race, uh, overseas. In my company, we had to protect each other because no one else was going to protect us. As for the racist bit, we had to learn to get along because in time of action, there was no color. But in the rear, that's a different story. We'd get like Indians in all our Chicano platoon. We would bullshit each other until someone would get mad. And sometimes we'd get into a fight, and the next day we'd be friends. They were brothers-in-law. That's what kept La Raza going. The Puerto Ricans were a lot like La Raza. In action, they did all their job. Everybody was a big family. It was togetherness. So uh, again, the, the, this, this commonality of cultures. Uh, and you see that, you know, time and again where when you're getting shot at, it just doesn't matter. But once you get back, there's really a good deal of segregation. And the Army itself was concerned about this because this often did lead to racial incidents. Um, haven't seen, uh, obviously, black, white racial incidents were, were, I don't know if they were common or typical, but they were not untypical. They were not uncommon. Um, I don't know if there are statistics on Chicano black or Chicano white or anything like that. Uh, in general, f uh, impressionistically, I get the sense that black and Mexican-American soldiers got along fairly well. There was this kind of common sense of being different, but that's just impressionistic based on some discussions I've had from people who talked about what their impression of the wider situation was. But I haven't seen, seen stats on it or anything like that. I also don't know about the, the level of Chicano officers or anything like that. Um, so again, I keep going back to that 25%. If that's, if that's a credible figure, that's fairly staggering and demands a, a, a much more investigation into it. This is an area that really hasn't been covered. I can't think of a good book that's actually studied. Uh, well, there's a new one that just came out I haven't looked at. It's called Sons of Atzalan or something like that on Vietnam and, and uh, Chicano soldiers in Vietnam. But other than that, there's some oral histories and things like that, but, but I haven't seen anything that really kind of 
looks at this and, and does a, a, you know, a documentary-based study on it, and that's just dying. It'd be a fantastic uh, a, a topic to look at. Um, now, you also see among Chicano soldiers, like among some African-American soldiers, linkage between the war in Vietnam and uh, America's situation at home. Um, this is around the same time that Cesar Chavez and the farm workers in this emerging Chicano movement are all very uh, much in the news. And so um, Chicanos, like blacks, link the two issues. And they talk about uh, fighting in Vietnam, allegedly for democracy, while they need justice at home. Um, in 1966, Puerto Ricans circulated a petition which links the two. Um, on the 89th anniversary of the proclamation of the Republic of Puerto Rico, we declare our firm and determined purpose of each and every one of the undersigned to not serve in the United States Armed Forces under any circumstance. In this way, we express our repudiation of the tyrannical law of the obligatory military service which is imposed by the North American imperialism on Puerto Rican youth as part of the colonial subjugation of our country. Uh, the rhetoric there may seem, you know, kind of uh, a jargonistic, but in fact, as I said, Puerto Rico had the highest percentage casualty rate, uh, more than any state. And so I think that you can understand where people are coming from. They, they believe in a, that uh, they have commonwealth status. Uh, a lot of Puerto Rican nationals consider it colonial status. And then to fight uh, and die in such great numbers really does see, uh, seem to them to be part of a... Uh, uh, you know, if not a conscious effort, surely an effort uh, in which uh, Americans don't really care that much about it, right? Um, oh, okay, I said I did uh, a, good, a good case study, a good uh, example is New Mexico. I thought I had these numbers. Uh, Hispanics made up uh, in 1970 27% of the population of New Mexico, but of draftees from New Mexico, uh, Hispanics accounted for 70 percent. So seven out of every ten draftees from New Mexico were Hispanic, though they made up just about a quarter of the state population. So they're being drafted almost three times more uh, than, um, uh, about two and a half times more than uh, their proportion of the population would indicate. Um, studies conducted by uh, a scholar in 1969 uh, said that Mexicans and other Hispanics were, were deeply, uh, quite significantly overrepresented in Vietnam, uh, both in terms of fighting and like blacks, uh, uh, Chicanos were often assigned to, to rifle companies and frontline point, things like that, uh, were often overrepresented in Vietnam. Um, one study said that uh, uh, in the Southwest, um, Chicanos made up about 10 to 11 percent of the population but represented 20% of the soldiers from the Southwest, from that region, killed in Vietnam, which would be double, 11% population, 20% uh, soldiers uh, killed uh, from that region. Um, by uh, the end of the war, uh, one uh, intelligence officer, uh, Ruben Treviso, said one out of every five Hispanics who went to Vietnam was killed in action. I don't know if this is based on statistical data or if this is impressionistic. Uh, it's maybe something of an exaggeration. I suspect it is a, an exaggeration. 20% would be, uh, you know, a, a tremendous number. Although, again, if, if you take that one quarter uh, figure that General Baca gave, it may not be an exaggeration. Um, it's, it's impossible to determine that, again, for the reasons I said at the beginning. Just statistically, it's real hard. Uh, but impressionistic evidence suggests that Hispanics did contribute a great deal. Oh, here we go. The Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, D.C., for example, has 103 Garcias, uh, 86 Gonzalez's, and 75 Martinez on it. Uh, conversely, there are 660 Smiths, 523 Johnsons, and 346 Joneses. So the numbers are what? About five or six to one. Uh, but again, I mean, the population, I would think, is even more. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There. The population disparity is even greater. So again, I mean, I think if, and that's not a, a scientific study, but I think it clearly indicates that you have a significant uh, difference here. Um, and the real problem, as I said before, is since Hispanics in the census are often folded in with everybody else, you can't get really uh, a, a sense out of that. Um, but even if you use the, the census figures, the ratio of uh, deaths uh, among Chicanos is about seven to one meaning that uh, you have about uh, seven times more uh, 
uh, um, wait a minute, ratio of, yeah, uh, the ratio of decimal population is about uh, 7 to 1. If you look at it in terms of pop just population alone, it should be about 20 to 1 between white and Chicano. So there's about, there's seven whites killed for each Chicano killed. And in terms of population, it should have been 20 to 1 because Chicanos are considered about 5%. Okay, so I'm not a mathematician, so forgive me if I am not doing this well. But I kind of, you kind of get the point. I mean, basically, this is all, you know, uh, overkill in a sense because we you know it's, it's fairly clear that there is a, there is clearly a problem at the same time there it, it, it kind of comes back um, at home as well in fact probably the biggest uh, uh, Chicano demonstration in the entire decade entire era uh, was was a, a protest against the Vietnam War the moratorium in Los Angeles uh, which occurred on August 1970 uh, over 30,000 people gathered at Laguna Park to protest the Vietnam War and what they perceived to be this large disproportionate loss of Hispanic lives in the conflict. Um, people from all over the Southwest uh, went there. Uh, the police, as quite often happens in these, uh, apparently fired first. They were provoked. They fired tear gas into the crowd. Uh, three Mexicans were killed, uh, most famously uh, a man named Ruben Salazar who was a, uh, uh, a reporter for the, for the uh, LA Times and also a, uh, I believe he was a TV reporter or a TV editor for one of the uh, uh, stations up there. He was actually just sitting in a bar talking to friends, interviewing him when a projectile came through the, uh, the window and, and killed him. Uh, and um, uh, basically, you know, most people, both white and uh, Chicano in, in LA, uh, really uh, took aim at the, the police for the way they responded to this. Um, so this also leads to a group of uh, militants uh, in the Chicano movement, the Brown Berets, which were kind of like a counterpart to the Black Panthers. Uh, Brown Berets, young uh, Chicanos who would wear Brown Berets and kind of had a paramilitary culture like the Black Panthers did too, and in large measure uh, a response to the Vietnam War and the uh, sense that there was a, an overrepresentation <coughs> uh, in it uh, among Chicanos. Um, so as with blacks, there, there are real distinctions here between statistics, between what one would think would have been the numbers and what probably were. And there's also this real sense of being cannon fodder uh, for a society that doesn't care about them at home but is willing to, to put them on the front lines in Vietnam. Now, that's not a, a dominant, it may not even be a majority view, but it's clearly one that's well spoken, that, that's articulated quite frequently. Um, you know, I've talked to a good number of, of, of uh, Chicano soldiers who don't have that sense at all. So, you know, by no means am I suggesting that this is uniform. It's an area that needs a ton more work, uh, a lot more work in it. All right. Uh, last but not least, I just briefly want to comment on uh, Native Americans in the war, um, which is is a similar uh, uh, a study. Um, um, as with uh, Blacks and Chicanos, Native Americans joined the military for similar reasons, economics and, and culture. Um, low economic and educational levels. Uh, in the 1960s, probably today, uh, unemployment rates on, on some reservations were staggering. I mean, they could be three-fourths, 80 percent even. Uh, education averaged about an eighth grade level on, on some of the reservations. Uh, the population was also quite young. Uh, the average um, Native American population during the Vietnam era was, was about 19 to 21. So you have a very young population without a lot of educational opportunity and huge unemployment rates. So not surprisingly, many of them turn toward the military. Uh, also, because they lack formal education, many of them, once they're in the military, many Indians are assigned non-technical military occupations, and you can see this with other groups as well. As I think somebody in the last class pointed out, the, you know, your scores on your test often indicate uh, where you'll be assigned, and so if you only have an eighth grade education, then you're certainly not going to, you know, go to office or training school or anything like that. Um, because of that, the percentage of Indians serving in Vietnam uh, was much larger. It was double that of the Indian population. Uh, Indians made up about 1% of the population, but about 2% of all troops. And again, 2% of the entire army is not a, it's a, it's not a huge number statistically. What did I say? There were 2.1 million uh, Americans who actually served in Vietnam, which would mean Indians made up <laughs> 42,000. 
Anybody do math in here? Is that right? Okay. 42,000. That's not a huge number, but again, proportionally, it's quite significant. Indians uh, uh, make up about uh, uh, 2.1 million. Would that be right? 200 in the, in the U.S., about 2.6 million uh, at the time. No, actually, we'd be closer to 2.1. I'm thinking today's population instead of then. So, um, you know, it's a fairly significant uh, number in that regard, statistically. Um, it's kind of ironic, too. I mean, Indians are often never brought up when, I mean, at the time, the issue, especially of African Americans dying in Vietnam, was a huge issue. Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Black Panthers, liberals talked about, I.F. Stone, people like that, talked about it all the time. Chicanos less so, but issues like the moratorium really brought it to the fore. But at the time, almost nobody discussed um, Native Americans. Uh, among all the ethnic groups uh, mentioned, there's really was that, that was probably the least uh, articulated. Um, and in fact, even among people like Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and Hispanic leaders, when they talked about this being, you know, having elements of, of a racial war, Indians were generally excluded from that. Um, uh, scholars would talk about the Indians as an insignificant population. Basically, they're too small to even worry about or that kind of thing. Um, so you get this kind of sense that it's not really that important. But in fact, uh, to Indians, of course, it's quite important. Uh, Indians, like other ethnic groups, like uh, Caucasian soldiers, many served admirably, won medals for their service, and so forth. Um, why did they go? Uh, for many of the same reasons. One stated, I went to Vietnam. I was wounded twice and won the Silver Star. Not because I have any particular loyalty to the United States, but because I have a loyalty to my own people and my own tradition. We are pledged by a treaty to provide military assistance to the U.S. in times of war. I know that the U.S. has broken its part of the bargain with us, but we are more honorable than that. If we respond in kind, we are no better than they are. The point is we are better than they are. We honor our commitments, always have and always will, even the ones that are inconvenient or unpleasant. So it was my obligation to do what I did, even though I didn't really want to, which I think is really kind of ironic. You know, as he points out, the U.S. has broken just about every treaty it ever made with Native Americans, yet many Indians felt honor-bound not to do the same thing. They didn't want to go back on their word. Um, I always thought as a child, I could never understand the term Indian giver. You know, it's, if you give something, take it back, which is a really derisive term. I just thought, even as a kid, it didn't make any sense to me. It's like, you know, you take the, the Black Hills and all the gold and everything from them. So, um, actually, I, I, if I thought of it, I would have, uh, I should have made a, a, what you call it, a transparency or, or a Xerox of this. There's, a, there's some good numbers here. I'll tell you what they are, and if anybody wants them, I can make copies of it for you. Um, Native Americans' reasons for entering the service, um, and I'll just give you the kind of very important, because uh, you could do more than one category. Uh, duty and country, 44%, which was the largest. Financial reasons, 20%. Respect from Indian people, 35%. Respect from non-Indians, 15%. Uh, actually, duty country wasn't the largest. Family tradition was the largest, 51%. Tribal tradition, 43%. So again, I think it's the kind of thing this person spoke of. And you saw Chicano soldiers often saying the same thing, the sense that, you know, we don't really care about the white government. We owe it to ourselves because we're not going to, you know, give them ammunition, so to speak, to come back a against us with. <clears throat> um, uh, in fact, uh, among the responses in the not important at all category, the largest was respect from non-Indians. That just wasn't a factor, you know, basically Indians didn't care if non-Indians didn't respect them. So that was the least uh, important reason for that, all right? Um, so again, and, and you would probably see similar numbers, the idea of of uh, uh, being uh, valued and respected in your own community is, is more important. Um, but as with other groups, the experiences of, of Native Americans, of Indian uh, soldiers in Vietnam was quite similar, quite ambivalent. You're fighting a war. You have a great deal of loyalty to the men you're fighting with. Uh, you trust them and value them. But there's also this sense that you're different. Uh, and um, Indians, it's, it's actually a different dynamic because culturally and historically, there's, there's just an entirely different tradition there. Uh, one Navajo explained it uh, this way. He said, a yellow, low-down, cowardly Navajo, you may think about me, but you are wrong. As a man, I look at the Vietnam conflict as a senseless war, which Americans have been fighting the Vietnamese for over 15 years. But as a Navajo, I look at war as if fighting alongside the white man who tried desperately to annihilate the American Indians fighting for what was once ours and now to protect what is no longer ours. Uh, 
So there's again the sense of ambivalence and real unease that, you know, uh, you're you know you're fighting for with people who have basically taken things away from you, but you feel obligated um, to do so in that case. Uh, again, um, Indians take a disproportionate number of casualties. Um, the Indian population uh, in the United States during the Vietnam era, my numbers were way off earlier, was actually less than a million. Uh, so American Indians, um, well, these numbers are different than the other group I saw. Uh, this, these numbers from a different study suggest that Indians were about 0.6 of the total population. The other figure suggested 1%. And again, I suspect that you could play with the census and come up with different numbers in many different ways. Uh, but this, this uh, uh, um, survey suggests that Indians were 0.6 of the population, but made up 1.4% uh, of all the troops sent. So again, it's about double. So either way you look at it, it's, it's a disproportionate uh, uh, number. Uh, once Native Americans are in Vietnam, what do they do? Uh, they're military specialties, they're MOS. 40% uh, infantry. 7% artillery, 2.8% uh, special forces, airborne about 8.5%, armor 3.5%, helicopter aviation almost 8, fixed wing aviation almost 5, and so on. But of course, uh, uh, infantry and artillery make up almost half, and those numbers are very similar to African American numbers as well. I don't know what the Caucasian numbers on this are. It may be in Chris Happy's book. I'm not sure. I would have to look that up, or you can look that up. Okay. Um, in terms of the units in which Indians were assigned, 42% uh, assigned to the infantry, 8% each assigned to artillery and airborne. Um, the type of combat experience, and this is really, I think, striking. Now remember, only about 10% of soldiers uh, saw actual en actually engaged in combat, but among Native Americans, heavy combat, 36.5%, moderate combat, 27.6%, uh, that's 64% either heavy or moderate combat, which is staggering when you consider 10% of the whole saw combat. Light combat, 18.8, none, 17.1. So when you think that, you know, about 90% of soldiers in, in, the Vietnam, in Vietnam didn't really engage in combat, but among Indians it was only 17%, so you can see there's a huge disconnection there between the numbers and, and uh, the type of assignments they had and the type of combat they saw and so forth. So um, again, as with African Americans or as with Chicanos, there is no single experience and I don't mean to suggest that there is. I'm not suggesting that they were all you know, angry or that they were all perfectly loyal, that they all won Purple Hearts and Silver Stars or that they all didn't. There are many different experiences there. But clearly, the idea that there was a, a contradiction is, is clear uh, among Indians as it was uh, with others, one soldier, an Indian soldier who was in VVAW, so he was an anti-war activist as well, uh, uh, said, uh, uh, explained it. You know, he talked about this, you know, difficulty of fighting in an army that represented a country which has not treated Indians well at all. Um, uh, but it's interesting the way he starts out with this little kind of a manifesto. By the time we were drafted or enlisted to fight in Vietnam, we'd already been indoctrinated for that war since childhood by the mythology of America. One myth we soaked up was cowboys and Indians, the long saga telling how white Europeans carved a great nation out of a land inhabited by savages. But when we went to war, it wasn't much like the movies, not much of a script. The guys in white hats weren't winning, and we weren't the good guys anyway. The victims weren't grateful. Death wasn't noble. War was mostly confusing and sometimes terrifying. At best, we survived to come back. And I think that's quite striking. I think, again, anybody could have written this, but it's particularly powerful when it comes from somebody who was on the wrong side of the Cowboys Indians game. Uh, later on I think this is also interesting because uh, this activist says, uh, then we looked again at our own history. Our war in Indochina turned out to be an all-American war. The Dominican Republic, Korea, Puerto Rico, Nicaragua, Haiti, the Philippines, Cuba, Mexico. American soldiers fought in all these countries, occupying some, annexing others, installing puppet regimes in the rest, extending or defending an umpire. A bitter irony, we had wanted to serve, we wanted to be patriots. African Americans whose parents couldn't vote, Chicanos and Puerto Ricans whose cultures dissolved into assimilated poverty, poor and working class whites tracked into the draft instead of college or the National Guard, Native Americans proving they too were real Americans. The real war, it turned out, was here at home too, and we had been on the wrong side. It's a, a real powerful statement which kind of expresses a lot of these real difficulties. Uh, um, you know, obviously, uh, very difficult to be a soldier in any war, and I think 
when you take the uh, kind of racial and ethnic uh, factors in play, it makes it even more so. Um, as I said, this is just a, a real brief overview of, of this. And um, as more and more people study Vietnam, I think these topics are going to become uh, uh, dissected a lot more. Um, we already know a good deal about the war. I'm not sure that we're going to find out anything else about the war itself that we don't know. You know, policy in the White House uh, or on the field or in Saigon. I mean, that's pretty well established. I think the, what really needs to be filled in now are the kind of, I, I wouldn't even call them periphery because these are really important subjects. The social aspects of it, the way the war is fought. Um, military sociologists and historians and people like that are always interested in the type of, a type of army you have, culturally and socially. Um, and I think that with regard to the Vietnam era, it's an area that people are just starting to work on and it's going to get a lot more uh, play in the future, hopefully, because it'll tell us a lot more about the war itself. Um, and it'll also be interesting to see, you know, comparative study of how World War I and World War II compare to Vietnam. Again, um, I think we have a tendency to mythologize previous wars as if nothing ever went wrong when, in fact, they had all kinds of similar problems. At the same time, I suspect that the type of problems that we've mentioned with regard to African Americans and Chicanos and Native Americans, this kind of ambivalence or inconsistency or hypocrisy, were probably greater in the Vietnam era. And I suspect this makes things a lot harder. Um, again, if one just gauges it from the military's own response to this, they're clearly greater. I mean, uh, American uh, uh, military leaders, the brass, was deeply concerned by the racial implications of the way w the war was going. Hence, Cray and Abrams saying, right now in Vietnam, only the poor, the black, and the uneducated have the right to die for their country in Vietnam. So I think there's a real sense at the top that there's a problem here. And the morale problems, again, we, I don't want to romanticize World Wars I and II, which had plenty, but I suspect they were probably worse in the Vietnam era. And it's real hard to get a sense of the comparative studies of this. So the kind of social history of the military in Vietnam is critically important. Uh, to talk about we could have won or we had to fight with one hand tied behind our back without investigating this just, does, just doesn't hold water. It's not an argument I would buy anyway, but I just don't see how you can even begin to suggest that until you look at the way the army was structured and the way soldiers fought. Uh, I mean, many military people basically said, you know, how can we ask these people to, to do X, Y, Z when they're all fighting against each other? We have a serious drug problem. You know, there's this real sense, what the hell are we fighting for? There's dissent within the ranks. I mean, I know for sure there was no group like VVAW in World War II. So whether that represented a, a, a very small fraction of the military majority one, it's clearly a problem. It's clearly a problem that people at the top levels of the brass is worried about. So by that, you know, for that alone, I think it's, it's certainly important. And I've just barely, if, probably haven't even scratched the surface of it. Okay, do you have a question? Sure. Has there been, uh, has there been any uh, work done on uh, the fact that if the military was this aware of the racial inequalities. Uh, what about the president and his men under, under Johnson, even Kennedy, uh, well, even Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, uh, and Nixon? We see the actual men mm -hmm. in and around the White House and the decision-making process making bigoted mm -hmm. uh, statements. Mm -hmm. uh, did, was there an element here that it was easier to send boys into an undeclared war because most of the ones fighting really aren't our prize sons anyway? Does that element crop up? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, uh, McNamara would never admit it, but critics suggested that's what Project 100,000 was. Okay. Things like that. It's a way to take kids who might cause trouble and, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there was a real sense there. I mean, all these guys took care to get their kids into the National Guard or, um, you know, get them assignments with stars and stripes. Um, you know, Johnson, uh, I don't know, once we see the tape, once we hear the tapes, who knows what he's saying, but, yeah. you know, obviously in the document, Johnson's not going to say, I'm going to let, and Johnson was not averse to using the word nigger. Right. So he's not going to say, I'm not going to let niggers die in Vietnam, right? But at the same time, you get a real sense that that's not a major issue because, right, it's not the Kennedys and people like that. In World War II, Kennedy's son was killed in Vietnam. Franklin Roosevelt's son fought in, in the Second World War. You don't have anything like that in the Vietnam era, so I think it is easier until King, you know, speaks out. Basically, I think that's that's a that's a huge turning point, and I think it speaks to that directly. The way they turned on Martin Luther King when he came out against the Vietnam War really speaks volumes, yeah. you know. Basically, up until that point, it really wasn't a concern, and King was afraid to speak out because he still has this civil rights agenda on his mind, and Johnson's been pretty good to him on that. And so when he comes out against the war, white liberals feel betrayed. I, I think I mentioned before a document from Harry McPherson, 
Johnson's, uh, one of Johnson's chief aides in, in uh, March of 1968, uh, uh, right after Tat, and where he says, the Negro is sullen and ungrateful. And again, I think that's quite telling, this idea that they're complaining now after all we've done for them, right? And, I'm, and, uh, and a lot of that, I think, stems from the problems that emerged in Vietnam uh, at that time, and especially after King's assassination in April when things get real ugly. And the military, I think, is really more proactive, far more proactive than the civilians on this. In the Nixon era, again, Nixon's withdrawing troops. It's not as big a factor. Uh, uh, so, um, I mean, he's fairly clever that way, even though anywhere activity continues, the numbers are way down. But, I mean, Nixon, again, was certainly not averse to playing the race card. I mean, anybody who remembers the 1968 campaign, he kept talking about law and order, but the commercials, when he talked about law and order, would show black radicals, and it was quite clear. You know, don't worry, I'm in, I'm going to put these people in their place. And George Wallace was very explicit about that, and combined, they got almost 60% of the vote. So I think Americans were, you know, let's, I mean, you know, this, this may sound cynical, but I'm not sure white America, certainly elite white America, all really cared all that much, you know, when poor kids, white or black, were the ones who were dying in Vietnam. I mean, and, you know, that's fairly understandable. You're concerned about your own butt. <laughs> I know I had family members who joined the National Guard and who continued their student deferments and whatnot. So, and that's, that's not surprising. Okay. Any, any others? All right, now we're going back to Vietnam. We actually may end this war. Uh, the last thing I talked about with regard to the war actually was, was uh, the peace treaty. Uh, and so in that regard, the U.S., in terms of actually being a combatant, was no longer involved. The war is over for American soldiers in Vietnam, but that does not mean the war has really ended. And in fact, the last time I talked a little bit about Laos, and the last thing I talked about, which was two or three weeks ago, uh, was Cambodia, and I think I got to the point where the Khmer Rouge had taken over, uh, really striking uh, the level of American uh, air war uh, in Cambodia was staggering. Uh, B-52s, uh, tens of thousands of tons of bombs dropped on a very small country. I think it was 300,000 tons uh, in the so-called secret bombings or the secret war. I, I still can't figure that one out, secret war. Um, you know, when, when you're dropping B when you're using B-52s. But uh, um, what this does, and, uh, and this is an argument put forward by Sidney Schoenberg, who was the New York Times reporter in Cambodia at the time, and William Shawcross, a British journalist who's written a book called Sideshow, which is really pretty good on, on Cambodia. What they saw, because they were there at the time, was that the Khmer Rouge really was able to exploit the American bombings. The Khmer Rouge was the real radical communist group. I mean, the Khmer Rouge and the Vietnamese communists did not get along. The Khmer Rouge wanted to create an agrarian utopia. These people are kind of even too radical for Mao Zedong in many ways. And what the American bombings do is disrupt Cambodian society and leave a huge vacuum. The leader, Lon Nol, who the Americans had essentially put in power through a coup against Sihanouk in 1970, has no real popular uh, support. And so with the continued bombings and the destruction, the Khmer Rouge become more and more influential and more and more popular. Sihanouk, in fact, if you remember Prince Sihanouk, he actually joins with the Khmer Rouge. And this gives them a great deal of credibility. And in fact, uh, as a result, I think, in good measure of the American bombings, in 1975, the Khmer Rouge come to power. And they're in power for three years. Uh, I'll tell you shortly how they're, they're ousted, but uh, in three years, um, they uh, go on a, a massive killing spree, which really does, in statistical percentages at least, rival what the Nazis did in World War II. Um, Cambodia's a small country, eight, nine million people maybe, and probably over a million were killed. Uh, it's real hard, again, the, the numbers, you see people playing in both ways. It's real hard to know how many were killed by the B-52 strikes and how many were killed by the Khmer Rouge, but the Khmer Rouge left huge mass graves full of skulls. I mean, you've probably seen photos of them, which are quite, quite powerful, quite, quite disturbing. Uh, they would kill uh, Vietnamese, ethnic Vietnamese, uh, some of the ethnic tribesmen in the area, uh, Buddhists, I believe. There were three or four groups, it was basically genocidal, three or four groups which were exterminated just because of who they were. Uh, people who uh, were considered to be cl too closely allied to the old regime, people who spoke French were, were killed, people who wore glasses since that was a sign of kind of being tainted by the West. So they really do go on this, this atrocious killing spree. Uh, um, 
The great irony there, as we'll see later, is that the U.S. ends up supporting the Khmer Rouge. I don't want to get too far ahead of the story. So this occurs after 1973. And again, this is in large measure because of the continued input of the United States. Right? So even though the peace treaty and Cambodia and Laos, remember, aren't included in the peace treaty. The peace treaty of 1973, the Treaty of Paris, is about Vietnam. So the U.S. has no treaty restrictions on continuing to support the governments in Laos and Cambodia. It's doing this on the up and up, so to speak. And the media is essentially going along uh, for the ride with it. So the war continues in Cambodia and Laos. What's going on with the enemy? I haven't talked about the Vietnamese for a while, and it is, after all, their war. And I want to talk a little bit about that. Remember that um, the, the theory behind the NLF and the PAVN was protracted warfare. The idea that we will fight for as long as we have to continue fighting um, uh, and, and we'll win. I mean, this is a very, very long-term strategy. And so setbacks are to be expected and they'll be weathered. That's the general attitude. Um, the period from Tet to the final victory, which is actually nearly, well, it's over seven years, is, is a real intense period. It's actually, ironically, in many ways, one of the most important periods of the war on the Vietnamese side, and it's the one we probably know the least about up to this point. Uh, it's a period filled with a great deal of loss and of an eventual redemption. It's kind of a morality play. Um, getting back to the Tet Offensive, which we talked about a few weeks ago, I think the traditional mainstream line is that the VC were wiped out during Tet. They just lost so many people that they couldn't recover from that, and the tide turned, but the U.S. had essentially given up. I think based on the work of people like Neil Vin Long and, and actually what I've seen, um, in fact, I was just at the LBJ Library again last week, and, and I found other documents which corroborated what I've seen so far. Um, in February and March of 1968, the American officials uh, were getting reports on a daily basis that the VC was re replacing its losses. Either through infiltration or through recruitment, the numbers weren't changing. So this idea that they've wiped them out and have them on the run, just no one believed it at the time. That's kind of been created afterward. I mean, even Harold K. Johnson, the Army Chief of Staff, said that. He said, we have to make policy based on what we now know. And what we now know is essentially that they're doing well. They're replacing their losses. Clearly, the Vietnamese lost 20,000 during the first two or three weeks of Tet. The U.S. lost about three or 4,000. So it's a five to one ratio. Some people suggest the VC lost 40,000. Let's use that number. That's an eight to one ratio. Doesn't matter. The Vietnamese can afford to lose 40,000 way, way, way more than the US can lose three to 4,000. I mean, when Time or Life, or I think it was Life Magazine, puts a picture of every soldier killed in Vietnam that week in its magazine, that strikes home in ways that it's never gonna hit home in Hanoi, this simple question of morale. Right, so I would argue, based on what I've seen, based on Yovin Long's work especially, that Ted does not decimate the uh, Viet Cong. In fact, um, the Viet Cong recuperates fairly well after February and March of 1968. The problem, Yovin Long points out, was that there were too many Tets in 68, one in May, one in August. Instead of, um, I forgot to put the map link on this, but you kind of get a sense of, you should, we should know Vietnam by now. Actually, I can, while I'm talking, go back and, and find a, I just find a map somewhere here. Yeah. <laughs> we know there's a map here. There we go. Um, instead of regrouping uh, to, the, to the sanctuaries, some of them in the west, especially in the delta, uh, they come back from mini tats in May and in August where um, there are new attacks in the delta and on Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City here. Um, at that point, the losses actually mounted far more than they had uh, uh, earlier on. Uh, these were really uh, uh, ill-planned uh, assaults. There we go. Get back to the right there. Uh, instead of regrouping in 1968, basically licking their wounds, planning, and so forth, um, they send the NLF sends soldiers back into these new engagements where the losses are quite heavy. That, along with Operation Phoenix, which was this uh, program to, quote, neutralize, to isolate Viet Cong infrastructure, uh, the enemy by 1969 was actually hurt. And so the numbers are, 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 are fairly significant by that time. Initial Tet wasn't the big problem. The later events, uh, the mini Tets and Operation Phoenix were. Had the Viet Cong regrouped at the time, it, it may have been a, a much different story. Uh, so, yeah. 
I, I think I might have read this in, in, in Novin Long, but wasn't Ted always supposed to have been a three-stage process, January, May, and August, and that it's basically a decision was made to go ahead even after the first phase and continue the last two, and that was probably a mistake, isn't it? Wasn't always a three-stage deal? Yeah. I mean, there, there, there's all kinds of contingency planning. I mean, the fact that it was a three-stage deal didn't mean that they couldn't have canceled the, the next two phases of it. Um, although, actually, I've even seen, I haven't done as much work because the reporting in February and March, the reporting is intense. I mean, you're getting gosh, scores of memoranda each day on the situation in Vietnam. You get less of that in May and August, but from what I've seen from the military's own archives, um, there was, these were still causing problems for the American forces. The Arvin had not recovered. The GVN was still shaky. Pacification was gutted. Actually, that, one of those books that I use for my own work, that Louis Weisner, who, who's documented all this refugee problem throughout, yeah. he says the same thing, that, that even though they were clearly less, uh, less intense, those latter two mini tets, um, it generated uh, thousands of refugees, each yeah. one of them generated for, for urban areas, particularly in Saigon. So yeah. they were quite disruptive, even though they might have been militarily less significant in the first. I mean, I've seen, um, you know, like military, ar the, the Marines archives, where they, they talk about the problems that are still being caused in the mini tets. And again, this gets to the whole question of just what the hell it means to win or lose. I mean, clearly the numbers were huge. The body count was way out of proportion in the mini tets. But at the same time, you know, creating a million more refugees is... You know, it's a horrible human tragedy, but in the, pic in the when you're deciding, you know, success versus failure, that actually means you've done something. I mean, you're, you're unsettling, and that was, I think, one of the real objectives of Tet, to unsettle Southern society. I mean, the Americans will say, well, they didn't overthrow the government, so it was a defeat. Well, yeah, of course, in the perfect, you know, you have a best-case scenario, right? You know, you have an objective, but if you don't meet that greatest, your greatest objective, it doesn't mean you failed. Yeah. I don't mean to totally monopolize oh, here, but this is, this is an area that's of interest to me. Um, at least the, the first few months in 1968, the, the, the offensive is so significant that pacification is entirely put on hold, mm -hmm. and they siphon off funds from other areas to be able to deal with refugees, which they spend up in about a month. And, and it, they end up resettling something like 5 or 8 percent of the refugees, and hundreds of thousands are for months, well into April and May, are not resettled. And then here, you know, on the heels of the first TET, here comes two more mini-TETs. And it, so it, it, 68, the entire year, is basically disrupted with civilian casualties running all over the place. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing that, you know, uh, uh, the United States has always had fairly traditional, conventional, European-style wars, and it's really easy to know whether they're succeeding or failing based on territory and whatnot. And so people, I think, try to apply these characteristics to things like Vietnam, to things like Tet. I mean, um, I'm still convinced that Tet was, a, was a disaster for the Americans. It was, I mean, that's why Vietnamization occurred. Vietnamization was a recognition of that. Look, uh, this isn't working. We've, we've got to figure some way to get out of this thing without too much blood on our hands and without looking too bad, without, you know, really being nailed for it. And, uh, I mean, something like refugees is really crucial when you are there to allegedly win the hearts and minds of people, to build a nation, nation building. And you have, you know, I forget what, what's the percentage of, of refugees? Uh, Oh, it's the numbers are something like five to seven million uh, in, in the whole of the in southern the south. half of Vietnam. Well, yes, which is what, refugees. It's like a fourth of the population. Oh, yeah, it's what, what, a fourth population of, of like 14, 15 million total. Okay, yeah, so you have almost half the country. It's like and, a third to a half the country. And very consistently in Saigon, the, re the refugee numbers are like 250,000 just in Saigon. They're sleeping in cemeteries and stuff. Yeah. It's just as a disaster. Right. And, and in a situation like that, occasioned by Tet, so, I mean, the, the body counts were huge. And there's no question that the Viet Cong had to retreat. Uh, after the mini Tets and, and the uh, uh, Operation Phoenix, but to extrapolate from that that the U.S. was somehow winning, I think, is really erroneous because the problems in the South were, were huge. I mean, refugees, uh, desertions, um, continued you know political problems. I mean, you know, the the, the governments of Nguyen Cao Khi and Nguyen Van Tu did not have popular backing. I was quite striking General Nguyen Khan a few weeks ago when he was here speaking, was talking about the election, you know, where ZM got like 97 percent of the vote, and he said that's what democracy in South Vietnam was. You know, he's not going to lie about that. So I thought that was quite, quite intriguing that this guy would admit, look, it, was, it wasn't there. And there were no free elections there. In fact, the one time in 1967, there were actually opposition candidates who were anti-communists, had solid anti-communist credentials, but were also willing to try to negotiate a peace. And the U.S. essentially gutted the election because these people probably would have beaten Win Van Tu, just as the U.S. had issues with ZM and Big Men and Win Khan in 63 and 64 when it looked like peace might break out. So, um, yeah, all of these things are huge factors. And beyond the body count, uh, you know, they, they speak volumes about this.
So by 1969, I mean, there's no question the Viet Cong, the NLF, is, is wounded badly by 69. I'm not sure really if it's wounded any worse than the South. I, I would argue it wasn't. Um, but the North has other problems. Psychologically, the war takes a, it has a huge kind of a, a I don't know, call it a crisis, but there's a, a, something of a catharsis and something of a, a, a national revelation. In September of 1969, Ho Chi Minh dies. So you can see I'm kind of all over the map chronologically here. The war's ended and now I'm back there. But um, Ho Chi Minh had been quite ill for some time with congestive heart failure, and he died in 1969. Um, it's kind of ironic, though, to see the way Ho would be used for historical purposes. Every society does this. In Ho Chi Minh's testament, in his will, he had uh, uh, given orders to cremate him and take his ashes and put a little bit of his ashes uh, on each of the three regions of Vietnam as a symbol of uh, unity. Um, instead, uh, the people who succeeded him, Van Van Dong, uh, Le Duan, General Jop, uh, put him in a mausoleum embalmed him, open uh, glass casket like Lenin, like Mao, so people could, you know, walk by and see him, so they would continue to use the image, the symbol of uh, uh, Ho Chi Minh, um, the, you know, kind of larger than life uh, memory of him. Um, so 1969, yeah. I think we're even allowed to go over there and see him now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a big tourist trap now, yeah. Probably get, you know, I went to Ho Chi Minh City and all I got was this stupid picture of Ho Chi Minh's mausoleum or something like that. Um, so 1968, 69 into 1970 are very difficult years for the Vietnamese. Uh, Ho Chi Minh's death, uh, Operation Phoenix. Um, there's not really a struggle for power after Ho's death. It was fairly clear what the line of succession would be, Pham Van Dong and Le Duan. But um, these people did not have the same aura that Ho did. I mean, this was Uncle Ho who was considered, you know, this kind of saintly old man. And Pham Van Dong and the rest tend to be typical communist bureaucratic functionaries. Ho has something of a poet in his soul, and these guys don't. So it's clearly a different picture. And, and the war is deadly serious, too. I mean, it always had been. But after 1969, there's this real sense that when's this thing going to end? This real sense of dread. Um, despite that, though, um, the NLF did regroup. Uh, and again, much of this comes from Yeo Vin Long. It regrouped. It maintained popular support. It recruited and infiltrated in the South, and by 1971, was probably stronger than ever. This runs counter to a lot of the traditional uh, uh, interpretations of the war. Neil Van Long says, popular support in the South, popular support in the South from the Southerners, not infiltration from the North, popular support in the South allowed the NLF to rise from the ashes of defeat like a phoenix. Notice the, the sarcastic pun there in spite of American efforts to destroy it. So Yelvin Long claims that in the South, the, the NLF remained popular and was able to rebuild internally. This is in 1971 when everybody else is saying it's all Northerners. So-called fillers was the name often used to describe these people. Um, at the same time, though, the level of damage is staggering. Uh, America's uh, very extensive use of air power, B-52s and, and tactical air, killing masses of Vietnamese in the north and destroying much of the countryside. The use of herbicides continues unabated. So um, by, through 1971 and 1972, um, it, before the Easter offensive, there's this real sense that the war is just dragging on. Uh, General Jap, however, in, in, in 1972, um, plans the Easter offensive basically as a way to send a signal to Nixon. I mean, Nixon, again, is hoping to grind down the Vietnamese. Uh, the Easter offensive becomes uh, a way to uh, send a signal to Nixon that this continuing the war is futile. It's futile. You can do this, but like Tet, we will take the initiative, and we will do what we want when we want it. And, you know, I would argue that that actually is a, su a successful signal. I mean, really, unless John Paul Van, you know, John Paul Van basically saves Contum. Central Highlands, and if that falls, then who knows what happens in 1972. And you can't keep fighting a war where you have to call in masses of B-52s to save your position. You, you just can't keep doing that infinitely. It just doesn't, doesn't work. Um, so uh, um, by 72 and 73, uh, the war, I think, has two different forms. On one level, um, according to Neil Long, uh, uh, the NLF, the insurgency, remains strong. At the same time, it's becoming a more conventional war, too. And the Pavan in the north, the People's Army of Vietnam, the, the, the regular army, 
uh, North Vietnamese regulars, the North Vietnamese Army, whatever you want to call them, uh, are taking on uh, more of the burden of warfare too. And things like the, East, the Easter Offensive was, was, was a, a typical battle, it was a traditional battle. You have an army, you know, coming down south, conventional forces, air power, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, the Vietnamese, despite the way the Americans reported it, saw the Easter Offensive as a great success for them. Uh, with the peace treaty in 1973, uh, the North Vietnamese figure time is on their side and they will win. They still are thinking about protracted warfare, though. No one is anticipating an immediate victory. They're hoping to have this thing over before 1980. They're thinking that, you know, the war will continue throughout this decade, throughout the 1970s. Um, by 1973, however, by mid-73, uh, a lot of members of the Politburo, Le Duan, and others were urging a final offensive to reunify Vietnam. Now, there was a debate in the Politburo as to how fast to proceed. There were still a number of the people who succeeded Ho Chi Minh in, in the North who thought it was best to take their time to wait. They were afraid of doing something that might trigger an American re-entry into the war or at the very least, you know, kind of a, a return of American air power to Vietnam. So there were others who said, let's go slow, let's take our time. It's the same debate that they've been having for, what, 50 years, and it's continuing. Uh, Le Duan, however, in 1973 thinks that things have changed, uh, in May, in, not necessarily because of what's happening in Vietnam, but because of uh, world events elsewhere. First of all, in 73, you have the Arab oil embargo and the first of the oil shocks. You have Watergate, which is getting real hairy, and Nixon is clearly uh, seriously weakened by that. The Paris Peace Accords, uh, even if something does trigger American reentry, Le Duan understands that the world will condemn Nixon. If Nixon tries to reenter the war, there will be, you know, all hell will break loose. And now the China and, v the, the, uh, China and Russia cards are essentially played against Nixon. Is Nixon willing to risk uh, relations with the Soviet Union, you know, with the PRC over Vietnam, which is, you know, kind of the reverse because Nixon clearly understood that the Chinese and the Russians weren't willing to risk relations with the U.S. over Vietnam before that. Now, the, the, the converse is the case. Is Nixon going to rupture this, this growing detente over by returning to Vietnam, risk condemnation? I mean, you know, he may claim that he's a madman, but is he really that, that mad? So this is Le Duan's... Um, uh, 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 argument. In addition to that, the American economy in the aftermath of the oil embargo and the oil shocks is in a recession. Is Nixon going to, you know, basically reinvigorate a war when there are far clearer and greater problems uh, at home? Remember, Nixon institutes wage and price controls, takes the U.S. off the Bretton Woods system. So there are clear all kinds of, and late, I mean, the, the Vietnamese were, I think, brilliant. You know, I'm not afraid to use that word. They were brilliant in the way they understood global politics. I mean, they, they, if you read Gabriel Coco, I mean, they screwed up bad after the war ended. But while the war was in progress, they just, it was incredible. Their insight, I mean, maybe it was dumb luck, but they just really called it right. And they understood in 1973 what the world looked like. Yeah. Are they still screwing up today? You know, Coco, <laughs> Coco, uh, Coco, I can't say the word, he signed off about 96. But I don't know what's happening between It depends on what your perspective is. I mean, if you like buying Nike tennis shoes or you have stock in Nike, they're doing just great. Um, it depends. I mean, this, this is, this, there are pretty clear lines of demarcation. A lot of free market types think it's just great. I mean, a lot of people who, you know, the left kind of tends to see this as a real, real problem. People like Coco see it as a betrayal. It just depends on what your perspective is. Um, if you're a businessman, it's probably a good place to invest. It's probably a good place to go. There are tons of Americans and Japanese and others like that there. They're setting up stock markets and they're setting up all kinds of businesses and whatnot. So it just depends on where your where your perspective is. Um, I mean, you know, I, I can't speak for Ho Chi Minh, but I, I get a sense it's not what he had anticipated 50 years ago. So, but who knows? He might there might be Uncle Ho's chicken shack if he were still around. Who knows? I don't know. Um, uh, market, socialism. market socialism, yeah. Um, so Le Duan and the others understand, I think brilliantly, the global situation. And they figure, now's the time. The Americans are seriously weakened. This uh, circumstance, remember what was Ho's uh, concept, the favorable moment. This is a favorable moment because the world is essentially conspiring against uh, a widened war at this point. And the Cambodians are getting pounded, but what the hell's Ho, you know, what do the Vietnamese, oh, Ho's dead, what do the Vietnamese care about that? They don't like the Khmer Rouge, they don't like La Nol. You know, fine, let them take the brunt of it rather than us. So there's a real incentive to end the war. Uh, and um, 
uh, this leads to the the uh, uh, the Denimois, the Great Spring Offensive. Um, by 1974, barely a year after the peace treaty was signed, actually, I would argue, pretty much as soon as the peace treaty was signed, Hanoi realized that that treaty would not end the conflict. Uh, the U.S., even though it had not re-entered the war, was continuing to supply Win Van Tu, as I said before, with millions of pieces of of uh, ordnance and, and uh, money and, and so forth. Uh, so they believed that reunification would not occur politically. They saw this as a repeat of 1954 Geneva or 1945 after uh, uh, the French left. Um, so what do they do? They begin preparing for a great final offensive. Um, they began to build a vast highway running, you know the map by now, from the 17th parallel all the way down into the Saigon area, okay? Uh, now this is quite striking, you know, when you think of it, they're, they're building throughout, you know, the, the Ho Chi Minh Trail into the south. So, I mean, they're, they're, they, they can conduct this kind of logistic activity within the enemy's territories. That's, that's not a good sign, you know, that's, that's not a good thing. Um, it's about a thousand kilos long with incredible connecting routes for uh, supplies and communication. In the Ho Chi Minh, trail is as I said before that's a misnomer it's not a trail I mean this is a a vast David Shoup a marine general who was opposed to the war called it the Ho Chi Minh Autobahn and it was just this incredible artery of roads and you bomb one and they move to another one it's really quite remarkable uh, by early 1975 this road network which was called Corridor 613 could handle 10,000 trucks 10,000 trucks and refuel them with a 5,000 kilometer pipeline Right. By when? By 75. Okay. Uh, in the end, ironically, they didn't have to use uh, uh, Highway 613, Corridor 613, um, because when the Pavin came over the 17th parallel, they so totally overwhelmed the army. They didn't even need the highways. They just basically controlled the day. Um, the, uh, um, the planning... Uh, uh, occurs in December of 1974 and Hanoi at that point decided uh, on a two-stage strategy with the ultimate goal of winning in 1977. So they're anticipating two and a half to three more years before the war ends. This is in December of 74. The goal is to attack across the 17th parallel and wear down the Arvin until they reach Saigon. Uh, the idea was to liberate first the Central Highlands in 1975, um, let me go back and do, a, do the map again. It's probably worthwhile here. The idea it, it ultimately to start here and infiltrate down and, uh, 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 until the, you're in the Saigon area by 1977. Uh, initial uh, goal is the Central Highlands, which is around here in 1975. So the planning assumes about a year in the Central Highlands. Um, however, uh, there were NLF, uh, PRG now, Provisional Revolutionary um, uh, Government commanders in the South who had a better sense than the Northerners did of how weak the Arvin was. And so they began to lobby for attacks further South rather than just, you know, kind of straight down Central Highlands. They're arguing for kind of tax all the way through down into uh, Saigon. Um, uh, the day after Christmas in 1974, uh, the attacks begin. General Van Tien Dung, who had 22 infantry divisions and tanks and artillery, uh, began to bombard uh, Fuklong province. I'm not sure that's on here, but it's near the uh, whoops, Cambodian border. They begin bombardments there. And um, uh, which is only about 50 miles from Saigon, right? So what, what you have here, you know, is, is a total bypassing of hundreds of miles so that, you know, the typical attack would have been kind of a due south. Instead, they're, gonna, they're going to attack here uh, initially so that, yeah. It seems like I recall reading that basically before 1975, the, the southern government had basically decided to just cut i -Corps, what was i -Corps, the northern part, and they had retreated, you yeah. know, almost, almost back to the delta, basically, so that... The, the North encountered very, very little resistance. Is yeah, that, do, you, do you find that's the case? Yeah, yeah, no, it absolutely was. I mean, they just cut through it. You know, that's why they were able to bypass all that. It just, uh, I, you know, basically two and key were, were concerned with protecting Saigon and then getting out with whatever they could. Um, oh, I think. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, it was the same thing in the Central Highlands, I think, because the Arvin had essentially abandoned, abandoned that mm -hmm. area. It was mostly control. It was mostly, et mostly ethnic minorities. Yeah. The, the town of Bami Tuit, which was the Central Highlands capital of the mountain yards, they were not, they were kind of indifferent to the war. They just wanted it to be over. Yeah. So they really had two, both I Corps and two Corps, that they could almost write off. That's why they made such a big move down yeah. through it, all the way south. Yeah, that, I mean, and, and again, the Southerners were more aware of that than, than, than Hanoi was. Hanoi was basically planning a typical strategy, you know, three, two phases, three years, and the Southerners were saying, oh, we, we, you know, it's, it's going to be much easier than that, right? Um, the, the yellow light is flashing, which means I need to shut up, which will make everybody out there happy. <laughs>